Hi, thanks for joining us today. If this ministry has impacted your life, we want to hear about it. You can send us your story at amen at vnchurch.com. Also, we would love if you would partner with us financially. You can go to vnchurch.com and click the Give Online or text your donation amount to 757-230-2110. To honor copyright laws, we have removed some audio and video elements from this message. Now here's this week's message. Relationships. They make up every human interaction and activity in our lives. Not only are they just a part of life, God made them integral into who we are. In God's Word, we find the ultimate guide in navigating conflict, relating to others, repairing broken relationships, and letting go of your past. Let's dive deep into the wisdom of God and get real. Good afternoon. It's good to be with you guys today. Um, yeah, if I haven't met you, my name is Sharon Mead, and I'm one of the uh, teaching pastors here at the church, and we welcome those of you that are online today to join us. Now, guys, uh, I'm going to continue in the series that we've been working with, which is building uh, better relationships. And today, I want to look at how to relate wisely, right? How to relate wisely to other people. And so that'll be our backdrop for today. All right. Well, as is my custom when I teach, I'm going to ask that we open in prayer. So if you'll just take a few moments, bow your heads with me, and I'm going to invite the Holy Spirit, which is God's presence. Okay? So let's just take a moment. Thank you, Father. Holy Spirit, I ask that you would uh, continue to come, Lord, and pour yourself into this room, Lord. I thank you, Father, that, you know, that you're here and that, uh, that every nook and cranny is filled with your presence and that you're very aware of each person that you brought in here today. You say you're so aware that you know every hair on their head. And so, Holy Spirit, I ask that they would be able to understand what it is that you want to depart from them. Father, we always need a touch by you. And so, Holy Spirit, come and do what only you can do. I can't have enough words, Father. But you, one word spoken, dropped into a heart, can change a lifetime. And so I ask, Holy Spirit, that you'd come and that you'd rule and reign and all that's done. Yes, in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right, guys. So as I said, I want to talk about wisdom. And if I were to ask you to just jot down what you think wisdom is on the side of your paper, you know, I might get responses or you might write down that, oh, wisdom is about a smart person, right? Somebody who knows a lot of facts. Uh, maybe somebody with a high IQ. If I were to ask you, uh, you know, who do you know that's like really wise, right? Or who have you studied that's wise? You might say, well, Albert Einstein, he's pretty wise, right? Or Madame Curie. Or how about, you know, uh, Stephen Hawking, right? Those are, those are the contemplatives that we have that we think wisdom resides in intellect. Yet the scriptures show us differently. It shows us differently. And today we are going to build uh, our discussion out of this James 3, 17. Go to your outline and we'll take a look at that. It says this, but the wisdom that comes from heaven, which is God, right, comes from heaven is first of all pure. Take a moment, circle that word pure. Then peace loving, I want you to circle peace loving. Consider it, circle that also. Submissive, that's another one. Circle that up. Full of mercy and good fruits. And I want you to put a big circle around that. And then lastly, impartial and sincere. Circle that. I've had you circle uh, six attributes that I'm going to talk to you today. But I want you to notice nowhere in there does it use IQ. Okay? Nowhere in there does it talk about our uh, mental capacities, right? It just kind of puts out these six attributes and says that's what you need to be going and integrating in your life. That's what it says. So that means that each and every one of us can be wise, right? Each and every one of us can reach wisdom. You know, when you read through the whole book of James, specifically in, in the chapter 3, you see that we are challenged to be wise in our lifestyle choices. And it's so important, I put it on your outline, that you want to make sure that wisdom is a lifestyle you choose. In James 3.13, it says, Who is wise and understanding among you? Let him show it by his good life. 
So wisdom is a matter of doing these attributes as opposed to just spewing or talking a lot, okay? Having fancy words. <laughs> All right, so we look at wisdom in light of working with other people, and you go, yeah, I know I need it, but the question is, how do we know if we're being wise with other folks? How do we know that? Well, I want to take these attributes that I showed you, and I want to talk about them. I've created uh, what I think are uh, things we need to engage in with other people that would help us. And as we're looking through these, I want you to be thinking about the relationships in your life. And I want you to look and say, hmm, how am I doing with that? You know, and kind of judge where you are now. And if there's something you specifically need to work on, I want you just to kind of circle it or give it a check, and you can give it some thought later. Okay, so let's go to our outline, how to relate wisely to others. First, if I am wise, I won't uh, compromise my integrity. I'm not going to compromise my integrity. In that James 3, uh, 17 that I read to you, the very first thing I had you circle there, it says that the wisdom from God, it, right, is about being pure. First of all, it's pure. So what does that mean? It means it's untainted. It means that it's trustworthy. You know, uh, and so when we look at this word pure, what really, in, when we uh, look in our own lives, what it's talking about is our integrity. That's what it's talking about here. It's talking about our integrity. To be wise means that you enter into this uh, place of integrity that lines up with what the Lord says. So because he says to have that integrity, I'm going to walk through life. I'm not going to lie. I'm not going to cheat and steal. I'm not going to take advantage of you. I'm not going to mislead you, right? Those things are unwise. And so the Lord says, watch the integrity here. I think it's by no means that he, this is a foundational. This is the first thing that we see when we're talking about wisdom. Why? Because it lays the foundation for us, the foundation that we find in our relationships. It, we need to hold good integrity, right? Uh, integrity is so important here. It's really what trust is built on, and all relationships are built up and out of trust. And so we need to know, like, if we decide to engage in lying, even if they're the little white lies, okay, let me make it more palatable, because I know you said, oh, I don't lie. Let me do, come right here. The little white lies, right? Well, when we do that in a relationship, what happens, and we're found out because you always are in a lie, right? What happens is it takes a ding at your relationship, and so you need to be careful how you conduct yourself because you erode the trust in a relationship when you enter into lying. And that's just one example. Really, what God is wanting us to attend to is the moral code of values that we carry around with us, that we shouldn't just read the word, but then we should try to get it inside of us to line up our values with his values and then live them out on a daily basis. Now, Proverbs 10, 3 says, a man of integrity walks securely. I love that. He or she walks securely if you have integrity. What that means is no matter what's going on, no matter where you find yourself, when you know that you have your values that are based in what the scriptures tell you, you have a strength about you. You know, you have a confidence about you. And so we need to make sure that our integrity is something that we attend. That's why the scripture put it first. Second, James talks about wisdom as being peace-loving. And here's how I interpret that. If I am wise, I won't provoke your anger, right? I'm not going to provoke your anger. See, wise people are peace-loving. And that means they're not looking for a fight, right? Have you ever met anybody that, that just, they like to argue, right? Right? Have you met them? I have, right? They just, it's like, it squeezes. Lost that? Okay, why don't you bring me a mic? So, uh, so it just kind of comes up and out of them that they, they love to, to argue. Well, I hope that's not you, because God says that's unwise. I once heard, thank you, handsome Jacob. Love the bow tie, bud. <laughs> love it. <laughs> okay, so here you go. Good? All right. So anyway, when we're talking about uh, making sure that we, are, don't, we don't, enter into conversations just because we like to be argumentative, right? And I was telling you about a man that I met who was uh, so argumentative that he wouldn't eat any food that would, would disagree with him. Any foods that would disagree with him, he'd eat them. If they didn't, he wouldn't, right? Okay, give me a break. I'm trying. That's, I live with Andy. He says, you got to have a silly joke in there somewhere, Sharon. I'm like, oh, my gosh. So let's try it again. Ready? I once heard about a guy who 
<laughs> I love this. Who was so argumentative that he would only eat food that disagreed with him? <laughs> okay. I get an A for the day, Andy. All right. So here you go. We're having some fun. We need to make sure that we don't approach people with an argumentative spirit. Proverbs 23 says, any fool, can, uh, any fool can start arguments. The wise thing is to stay out of them. To stay out of them, guys, right? So here you go. I'm going to pick on marriages for a few moments here. Yeah, everybody, mm -mm, pay attention. Okay, so here you go. Uh, it took me all of six months being married to Andy before I figured out where his hot buttons were, right? Right? You girls, you know what I'm talking about? Guys, you know what you're talking about? Hot buttons are, you know what to say to push these buttons that get a reaction, right? And it's usually a negative <laughs> reaction. It usually sends somebody into this place of anger or just losing it. And so whenever I was in an argument with Andy and he was winning, I was thinking, oh, no, I know your code. <laughs> so I'd go in and I'd push those buttons, and then I'd stand back and went, pow, and I'd go, see, I win because you're irrational, Right? <laughs> Yeah, okay. Well, I thought I won, but did I really win? No. No, I didn't. No. The Bible says that that is foolish, that we don't want to do that. But I'm going to tell you, I've been married for a long time, <laughs> long time. And so here's the thing. You have to be disciplined not to push buttons. Let's get real here. You got to work on it, okay? You have to begin to, to work on how you're going to handle the conflict in your life because conflict with people that you're in relationship with is a natural thing. You're going to have conflict. And we're going to talk about This is so important that we're going to talk about it later in our series, how to handle conflict. But listen, when conflict comes up, you know, you've got to have redefined what winning looks like. If winning is about getting somebody to agree with you, right, it's somebody to, um, to just do what you want them to, that, that's not winning. Winning is when you take the time to talk to somebody and to hear them out, hear what they, they say, and you, you give your opinion, and you do it respectfully and lovingly. That's where you find the, uh, the win. That's where you find the win. And so we need to be careful. Button pushing happens a lot in marriages. It happens, you know what? It happens a lot in work and in school and when you're working with your kids. So don't check out on me if you think I'm not married. I don't have to listen. Yeah, yeah, you do. You do, because this is something we engage in. Matter of fact, I want to tell you two buttons pushing uh, that I see that's very prevalent with everybody. And the first one is the comparing that we do. We compare somebody with somebody else, and usually it's in a negative light. Like, why can't you be like Kalika? She's a better friend than you are, right? Or you're just like your dad, and I don't like him, right? So we're comparing in negative lights. So that's a way of pushing buttons. Another one that's very popular is condemning. You know, that's like that, that absolute uh, disapproval, you know, where you look and you go, you shouldn't have. How could you do this? Anytime we start with a you, right, no matter how bad we are, it's not a good thing for your relationship. So you don't want to have you ought, you must, you should, you never, you always. That just beckons a, a fight. So you don't want to do that. We want to be wise. We want to build harmony, right? Because wisdom is about peace loving. Now, the second thing here, or the third thing he talks about is he talks about being considerate. He talks about being considerate. So I've pulled that out, and this is what I have for you, number three on your outline. If I am wise, I won't minimize your feelings. If I am wise, I'm not going to minimize your feelings. You see, wisdom is considerate. If you look in the good news, it, say, it says it's gentle, that same word. Or if you look in the living Bible, it says it's, you know, it's polite, it's, uh, it's soft, right? And so when you look at that, you look at this uh, being considerate as something that you have to be mindful of other people's feelings. And so we need to take that seriously. And I know I throw the word feelings out there, and it goes, whoo, because there's some of you that go, oh, I hate that word. I get confused with it. Now, here you go. Here's what I found uh, that causes a lot of people issues in relationships is they make the mistake of thinking uh, logically in this way. They go, you feel that way. <laughs> I don't feel that way. You shouldn't feel that way. You can't feel that way. Stop it, right? That's what fuels a lot of counseling, by the way. I just, I'm just saying. 
that kind of thinking when you dismiss somebody's feelings like that? You see, feelings are not right or wrong. They're just simply feelings. That's all they are. Like today, I could ask somebody on this side of the room, what do you think about the temperature? And they might go, oh, it's freezing. I might ask somebody over here, and they go, oh, it's hot. Now, can they both be right? Yes, because it's their, their body reacting to the ambient you know, temperature that's in the room. So, yes, they both can be right because it's about feelings of perception. So here's how it works in marriage. Your spouse says, I am so depressed. And then you go, wait a minute. You can't be depressed. There's no logical reason. Stop it, right? That's unconsiderate. That's unconsiderate. You don't want to do that. What you want to do, if you're a husband and your wife says that, you want to just sit back, okay? You got to take off the hat that says, I need to fix this thing. That's your first hat that you remove. The other one is, I'm going to figure it out because she's a girl and you never can, okay? I'm just saying. I'm going to send you, a, you know, a little message. Don't try. But what you can do is you can actively listen. Active listening is, I hear you. That must hurt. Wow, I didn't know that was going on. Those kinds of messages, they say that you are sympathetic towards somebody. And gals, if your husband says that to you, that he's depressed, you can't fix it. And it's not your fault, okay? You can't fix it. So I want to encourage you to figure out what his love language is. Right? And then you need to figure out how you can show sympathy in that. Maybe you're going to go golfing with them. Ooh. Or you could cuddle with them at night if you get my drift. Right? <laughs> yeah, works for me. Believe me, that's a freebie. So you want, to, you want to figure out a way of connecting with your spouse in a loving, kind way. All right. Feelings are just feelings. Uh, they're based on a unique person's perspective of what's going on in their emotional domain. You can't fix it, and you shouldn't minimize it, right? You just accept it. The Bible says in Proverbs 15, 4, this is, it says that wor uh, kind words bring, and I want you to circle that word, life, but cruel words crush. I want you to circle that crush your spirit. So we've been given this power. God has given it to us to use our words to either bring somebody up or to crush them, right? So we've got to be careful. I was thinking about this, uh, this thought, and uh, for me, I don't know if you're aware of it or not, but I have a learning disability, all right? I have dyslexia, and when I was a kid, oh my gosh, I had such a hard time in school, right? Um, trying to learn the way the teachers wanted me to was just brutal, it was brutal. Well, my dad was also in the Air Force, which meant every two years we moved to a new school system, okay? And so this was one of those moves where... You know, we landed, I'm in a, a new school system, new teacher, and this particular teacher that I have, and I'm probably in around the fourth grade, fifth grade, anyway, this teacher, uh, she likes to do her spelling bees by having you stand up <laughs> and tell the, you know, to spell it out loud, and if you get it wrong, the class, somebody in the class is going to correct you. All right, this hit right in my disability of sequencing, right? So I thought, oh, dang, Skippy, I'm in trouble. And so, you know, my turn came. Sure enough, I stood up, and I started to try to give it, but all the letters are mixed up. The class laughs. Somebody stands and corrects me. Now, that pattern went on and on for 30 minutes. It was brutal. And then finally, the bell rang. <laughs> I could go to recess. And so I scurried out as just as quick as I could, you know, and I was leaning up against the fence because I didn't know anybody, right? I'm a new kid. And so my teacher comes over, and to this day, I can remember her words because they crush me. She came over, and she put her arm around me, and she looked at me, and she goes, you know what, Sharon, you're cute. You're really pretty. Somebody's going to want to marry you, and they'll take care of you, and you won't have to spell. I thought, oh, my gosh, right? So, so harsh. They were words that crushed me. But, you know, I also had another voice, which was louder. It was the voice of my mother. And so my mother would uh, sit with me every day after school and well into the evening and she would watch me reteach myself what I didn't get in the day, right? And try to complete the work and the assignments. And she would, you know, be doing her stuff. She's a mother of five, so you know, and I'm the oldest, one of the oldest. So anyway, she would she would come by me and she would look at me working and she would say, Sharon, she would never fail. She says, Sharon, you are beautiful and you are smart. 
And if you keep at it, you're going to learn it. It might be hard right now, but you can do this. And you know what? You can be anything you want to be. You put your heart to it, and you'll do it. I know you can. I believe in you. She'd walk on. And so she kept feeding that. And you know what that became for me? The wind in my sails. Became the wind in my sails to take me. And I did continue to go on in education. I ended up getting a master's degree in education. But, yeah, that's huge if you know about what it means to have a learning disability. So here you go. Words. Words can either crush us or it can just be the wind in somebody's sail. So we need to be able to think through our word choices also. Now, the scripture, as it was talking about wisdom in that James 3, 17 verse, it also talks about an attribute, which it says uh, submission. It uses this word uh, that wise people are submissive. So what the heck is that? Well, when I went back and I was looking at the Greek on this thing, uh, what I saw there was that it's actually referring to one who is open to reason, one who is open to reason, one who allows for a variance of a points of view, right? So here you go. Here's number four for you. If I am wise, I won't criticize your suggestions. If I am wise, I will not uh, criticize your suggestions. That means I'll give you an open ear. I'll listen to what you have to say. I won't be closed, but I'll be open. People that are wise are humble. They know that they don't know everything, and they can learn off anybody. And so they will be open to receive information that others want to share. They're not afraid to hear. And so anytime you're not teachable and you close up, right, and you have to be so guarded about what somebody's going to tell you or talk to you about, then you're being unwise. You want to have a posture of being open. So here's some questions for you. Let me ask you. Let's see how wise you are in relationships. Can your friends reason with you? Can your friends reason with you? Or do you always have to have the last word and, the, and that you know it all? Okay? How about your children? Can they reason with you? Or do you, or do you when they start talking, you go, ah, they're young, they're inexperienced, and so you dismiss them. But what about your spouse? Can they talk to you? Can they reason with you? Or no, I've got to have, you know, the final say here. I can't show any uh, weakness, and I don't want to admit that I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> right? Or how about at work? When you're at work and your colleagues wanna, want to uh, reason with you or maybe show you a different way of doing something. Is it closed-minded? You go, no, no, no. We've been doing this for years, and we've got to do it this way. Guys. We need to be open to people. In Proverbs 12, 15, it says, A fool thinks he needs no advice. A wise man listens to others. And so if we're going to have wisdom in our lives, we need to be open to hear other people with various points of view and not get offended. Okay? Now, with saying that, I know there's some of you that goes, Yeah, but some people can be so critical. Right? And they criticize me and... Uh, that's hard. What do I do with that? Should I listen to that? Well, I know that being criticized is hard. It's harder on some people than other people. And so I want to encourage you to, to set up a, a way where if somebody comes to you with a critique, that uh, give them, as long as they're respectful, give them the time to listen. And if you find some truth in what they say, admit it, right? And then take that and use that and see if you can learn something from it and grow from it. And by the way, when I say the truth, that somebody's coming, they're going to give you uh, their ideas. When you look for the truth in it, it should always be the truth that the Word of God says. Is it based in that, not in the culture? Okay? So that's going to be our truth uh, barometer there. Also, if they come to you and there's no truth in it, then you just got to let it go. You got to walk away. You can't let it devastate your life right? You got to know that God is your ultimate uh, judge in life, and so you can't be bothered by a critique that's uh, not founded in truth. You just have to walk away. Forgive the person and walk away, right? So, uh, again, we're going to talk about how you deal with co navigate conflict in a couple of weeks, and that'll address this a little bit more thoroughly, okay? The next thing, our wisdom, it talks about it being merciful and full of good fruit, and so when I was looking at that, I came up with this on number five. If I am wise, I won't emphasize your mistakes. If I am wise, I'm not going to emphasize your mistakes, right? So listen, this is kind of like when you do a gut check with the kind of person you are, when you see somebody flub up or blunder, 
do you like draw attention to it? Or how about if somebody's um, made a mistake, do you cover it up and then save it for later and you use it for leverage? How about if somebody's really hurt you and caused you a lot of pain in your life? Are you able to offer them forgiveness or do you withhold that? These things indicate that, uh, that you're, you're, not, you're, you're not rubbing out their mistakes, you're highlighting them. And so wisdom says don't do that. In Proverbs 17, 9, it says, Love forgives mistakes. Nagging about them parts the best of friends. And so we need to know that wisdom is calling to us to be merciful. So what am I talking about being merciful with people? Well, mercifulness and giving mercy is about giving somebody what they need and not what they deserve. It's giving them what they need, not what they deserve. And after all, isn't that what God has done for us? I know that's what he did for me. He didn't give me what I deserved, right? He gave me what I need. You see, if we got what we deserved, none of us would be here. I wouldn't be standing up here, right? I'd be dead <laughs> for all the sins I have committed. Yet what God did is he gave me what I needed, which was mercy. And he gave it to me in the form of his, his son, Jesus Christ. You see, the sins that I participated in, that you participated in, well, with the holy God, somebody had to pay the price for those because if not, then anybody could hurt anybody and we wouldn't have any, any right or wrong. And so the Lord is whole and he's true. And so what he's done for us is he's taken the sins that I have committed and you have, and he's placed them on his son, Jesus Christ. And so Jesus Christ now becomes our atoner, the one that pays for our, our mistakes. And the way he did that is by dying on the cross for us. This is so important that you get this idea because once you do and you're like me, we, I got it. I know how much mercy my father has shown me by giving me Christ that I could not be anybody but his loving servant. And if somebody needs mercy, I'm going to give it to him. I'm going to give it to him in abundance. Why? Because I have received that. Now, if you can't give per, you know, somebody mercy, I would say that, first of all, do you know who Jesus Christ is? Have you accepted him as your savior and made him the leader of your life? And if not, in a few minutes when I close, we can pray, and, and God accepts everybody, and when you pray, he'll accept you as a, as a child of God there, and he'll depart mercy. And if you have prayed and you're struggling, well, listen, the best way I know is to, to ask you to, to reach out to somebody else, reach out to another Christ follower and talk to them, because mercy needs to be flowing from us. It shows and indicates that we get what happened we get it. We get the importance of what Christ did for us. And so I want to encourage you also in that. All right. So mercy. We talked about that. But this passage also, or this phrase they use for wisdom, also talked about adding good fruits. Adding good fruits. Well, what is that? Well, what I think it is, and, and I interpret that to be, is that it's talking about the, uh, the spiritual fruits that we get, right? The fruit of the Spirit. And we see that in Galatians 5.22. You can write it on the side of your outline. Go look at it later, right? Galatians 5.22, where you and I are asked to put on and to learn the attributes, right? There are nine of them. What are they? They are being able to love and have joy in our lives, be able to work with peace and patience with individuals, to be kind, to be good to, the, to the people around us, to be faithful and to be gentle, and above all, to have self-control. You see that? Those are the things God wants us to grow in. When we operate out of those fruits, when we give people mercy, then we are wise. God says, then you're wise. Now, the last thing that James does to close out this scripture on wisdom is he says that wisdom is impartial and sincere. What is that? Let's talk about genuineness. So your last point, this is what I take out of it. If, it, if I am wise, I won't disguise my weaknesses. I will not disguise my weaknesses. In other words, I won't put on a mask, and you shouldn't either, right? We need to be able to um, take off masks and just be real, be who we are, uh, it, weaknesses and all. And I know this is counterintuitive. I know that. But then when we have the Holy Spirit, he can help us to be more vulnerable, to open up so that people can see who we are, that they can see the sincereness and the, rea the realness of who we are, the authentic you know, person that, 
that, that person that's in secret comes out in public and you are here, warts and all, right? You just show up and you be you. And Jesus says that's what he wants from us. He doesn't want us to hide, especially about our weaknesses. In 2 Corinthians 12, 9, the Apostle Paul pens this about weaknesses. But he, God, said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weakness, so that the power of Christ may rest on me. And you see, God wants to use the pain in your life. He wants to use the, the weaknesses that you have. When you yield them to him, he does this thing that only he can do. He breathes on them, and he uses them for our good and for people around us. You know, this past couple of months, I've been working with uh, the pastoral team, and I've been challenging them that uh, we need to embrace this new management system that, that uh, we've been trying to bring in, and the reason being that it can make us more effective and uh, efficient in our ministries that we're running. And so anyway, I've been bringing that. We've been talking about it for months, and I could see that they were kind of glossing over in their eyes, right? How many of you guys know when you got something that works, right? It's hard to go to something that you don't know or to recreate it. It's like moving from good to great. Very difficult. So anyway, I was seeing this glossiness. I went to the Lord and I said, Lord, what do I do here? And the father said, why don't you share your own struggles with this? And I thought, oh, no, I don't want to, right? Can you not give me something spiffy to say? <laughs> and he said, no, I want you to share your heart. I was like, okay. So one of the, the meetings we had, I just simply put up there the structure I had, and I said, this is why I haven't been able to give you the kind of time that you deserve. This is why we're falling short. This is my issue that I have with the system we have right now. And it was kind of silent. And I said, and I tell you, I've pushed back, and I've thought long and hard and said, Lord, because it's such a hard process to change what you've been doing for so many years. And I said, am I done? Am I done? Do I need to pass it on to somebody else? And as I was in that place of being real, right, God does what only God can do. And so um, he breathed on the people right in the midst of me sharing my weaknesses and my insecurities and thinking, can I do this? Am I going to be able to take it to this next level, Lord, right? Well, that day we ended. We moved on to another topic, and I thought, well, I, I think I'm obedient. So I went in my office, and I'm going to tell you, I had all week long different pastors popping their head, and they go, thank you. Thank you for sharing that, because I thought it was just me. I thought I'm the only one that felt this. I thought that I'm the only one that, that felt so, so alone in this. And with you sharing, I now know, no, God's doing something. And he loves us, and he loves the people that he brings here. And if this is what God wants, we need to do it. And I tell you, I saw a shift that happened in, in the pastoral staff and, and the support staff, and they're starting to move now to, to embrace this and to actually, they feel good about it, and, and they're looking forward to it. Guys, I tell you, from a distance, you stand from a distance in people, and you can dazzle them with your strengths. But if you really want to impact people, you come close and you lean into them and you tell them about the weaknesses you have. Yeah, it's, it's huge. It's huge to help people to move from good to great. And so it's something we need to be doing. Now, here's my final thoughts on this whole concept of wisdom that we've been talking about. You know, we look at these attributes, and if you're like me, i like, oh, fell short, fell short, fell short, you know? But here you go. Thank you, Jesus. Because when we know who we are in Christ, then we are able to upright ourselves when we and, and take a look at what's actually going on. You know, um, one of the things that I have been engaging in for many years, and I would encourage you to do this, is every morning I spend time with the Lord. Every morning I read, even if it's just a sentence, and I like to journal, and I talk to the Lord about whatever's on my heart. And I tell you, in there, I went back, I was looking through my journals, and you know, I always start with, come Holy Spirit, come Lord. And then my very next one is, give me wisdom and understanding so I can be faithful with the people that you brought to me, that I can see my own stuff and know how to navigate it, right? I think when we're there and we're real before the Lord like that, 
then those scriptures that he places in our heart that says, if you seek me, you will find me. If you seek me, you will find me. And he says, then ask me. Ask me for wisdom and see if I won't give it to you. And I won't predicate it on how well you're doing. I just give it to you because I absolutely love you and I want to help you. And so that's what the Father wants us. He wants us to be wise people, a wise people. Bow your heads with me. Holy Spirit, I know you've been here. I can sense you. And so, Lord, I thank you that you spoke your words today. I thank you that um, they were like seeds that you scattered, Father, in the hearts. And, Lord, for those hearts that you've prepared for them, I ask that they would grow up, that that seed would grow up and, and mighty, yeah, I see that, a mighty tree would grow up and that the uh, birds of the air and people could find shelter under it, Lord, that they could find rest. And so I thank you, Father, for all that you're doing here today. I thank you that you love us so much that you want to make sure we understand your words so that we can make a difference in the relationships that you have bestowed upon us, that you have given us, Lord. Yes. And so, Father, I hear those of you who do not have uh, mercy. Right. It's a lot of it is that you didn't start by um, letting Christ be number one in your life. And so I want to encourage you today, if you want to be able to experience it for yourself, have this mercy, then I want you to just pray with me right now where you are with every head bowed and eyes are closed, people that have made a decision to put Jesus in their life, to make, let him be the leader, they're praying for you right now. And I'm going to encourage you to pray with me. You just say, um, Father God, I want to experience your mercy. Mm. I need to experience your mercy. I can't give what I don't have. I accept your son, Jesus Christ, as my Savior. Just go ahead and pray that right now. Just as my Savior. The forgiver of my wrong choices. And Jesus, the best way I know how, I give you the reins of my life from this day forward. Now I want to pray for you guys that were praying that prayer. Father, I thank you that you sealed it in their hearts, Lord, and that you have written their name in the book of life that resides with you. Now, Father, I commit them to you, and I ask, Lord Jesus, that you would continue, Father, to continue to um, walk with us, continue to make us a people that are like, mm, yes, Father, I hear that. Okay, so, so what I feel like the Lord is telling me is that we desire to be like a lighthouse on, um, on an island that would shine out for all that are lost at sea to come in. And so for those of you that have been saying the relationship issues are somebody else's fault, if somebody else would just do this or that, and the Father says no, he wants to talk to you, he wants to make you that mighty lighthouse where you'll shine, where you'll shine out. But he's calling you to come closer, and, and I hear that some of the integrity issues that lie in the room. He says he wants to grab hold of those, and you know what they are because he's been talking to you about those when I mentioned that. Or we laughed when I talked about pushing buttons, but God said so many people, so many, and those are destroying you, and they're destroying your relationship. Father, I hear your voice, and I ask, Lord, that you would continue to just wake up. Wake us up, Father, where we are been complacent that we would have the power to bring change into our relationships. And I thank you, Father. I thank you that you are always, always on spot, that you're working with us until we become a people that will love you with all our heart, all our mind, all our soul, and with every breath of life that we have, that we will worship you and love you. In Jesus' name, amen.
Thanks for listening to this week's message. We hope you enjoyed it. Don't hesitate to write us your story at amen at vmchurch.com. And we'll see you next week.